Do you spend hours in your head thinking about something that happened, could have happened, or might happen? Do you ask others what to do so you don't make a mistake? Welcome to the Playing It Safe podcast. I am Dr. Z, your host. I am a clinical psychologist, an author, and a person that is super passionate about sharing with you science-based skills to overcome any type of fear-based struggles. Who doesn't experience fear? Who doesn't play it safe? In this show, we will discuss how fear-based reactions happen in day-to-day life, how playing it safe behaviors look like, sound like, and feel like, how you can put into action solid tips from behavioral science to get unstuck from worries, fears, obsessions, and anxieties, and how you can start doing what works, what matters, and what you care about. Behavioral science doesn't have to be boring. Thanks for listening, and let's get started. Have you ever had moments in which you felt love but didn't feel seen? Hi everyone, this is Dr. Z, and in this episode, you will learn about misattunement and how, instead of playing it safe by avoiding, placating, or judging yourself, you can learn skills to emotionally connect with people that matter in your life get close to them and be fully present with them. Attunement is the ability to be aware of another person's emotional needs and respond to them appropriately in a given situation. In this episode, I interview Dr. Kelly Werner, who kindly shares her understanding an approach to struggles driven by chronic misattunement. You will learn about chronic misattunement, how planet safe moves could be related to chronic misattunement, how chronic misattunement shows up in relationships, and how you can use the acronym ATTUNE to connect with others in a meaningful and fulfilling way. I wish you a great day, and now let's jump onto the podcast episode. Bye-bye. In your email, you shared with me your interest and passion for working with clients with chronic misattunement. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can start by asking you, what's the story behind that topic? Well, it's me. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. So it wasn't that hard to find it. I appreciate that vulnerability, putting yourself out there. (laughs) Yeah. So a topic I'm really interested in with clients at the moment is like when, and I have a lot of them at the moment, when people have been chronically misattuned to often by a parent or their family in childhood, but um, also it can happen like one client actually it happened in her church, like her childhood was kind of fine, but the church was really forcing their beliefs on her and had zero interest in her. And and then other times I hear about it in marriages or long-term marriages. So it's at any stage of life, but um, so I have a lot of clients with it, but in my case, yeah, I feel like I was chronically misattuned to, um, I'm more of one of these empath type people and in my childhood a bit, even though my parents were amazing in a million ways, like they just gave their life for their kids. Um, But someone said recently that love is not the same as attunement. Mm -hmm. And so um, I do feel like I was emotionally misattuned too. And then that led to me kind of coping with self-sufficiency And, um, and then I think it led to me feeling depression and, and then I see that in my clients too, who have been chronically misattuned to like, it'll lead to depression and many other things like substance abuse or anger issues. And so just in my own healing journey in this lifetime, um, I, you know, tried a million different things so that I don't feel depressed. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, And then I'm also really interested in helping uh, my clients kind of with the same thing. And it's, it's this unique category that I didn't learn about in grad school or in any of my trainings where 
it's not physical abuse or sexual abuse or it's by well-meaning like people that are kind of trying their best but they like you know it's emotional neglect or emotional abuse or like some gaslighting and so it's, it's like this little t trauma that like mm -hmm. you think you should complain about or you should get over um but actually you're you're suffering and struggling from it like as I did, and I have so many clients too that have yeah, been in this situation. So it's a little bit my story. <laughs> Kelly, as I am listening to you, I just want to say once again how much I appreciate your openness to put your story out there. Uh, I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of vulnerability in what you are saying. And I'm grateful that our listeners are going to learn from you today. Um, you're describing that your parents were these really incredible, caring, and loving people. Mm -hmm. There wasn't any history of physical abuse or emotional abuse or any form of abuse. And mm -hmm. yet, even though you felt love, there was this misattunement. Yeah. Um, some of the characteristics of this chronic misattunement is feeling emotionally alone, having mm -hmm. self doubt and shame because of the struggle. Yeah. If people are listening to us and let's say that they are feeling alone, they're having some doubts about what's wrong with them, or yeah. they are having some feelings of shame because sometimes we know when something is off with us, but we yeah. cannot put words to that experience, right? Mm -hmm. There is experience, but we cannot describe it in words. It feels this amorphous thing. Because I think what I am understanding from what you're sharing is that chronic misattunement many times can be unseen and it can be hidden perhaps to our rational awareness, totally. right? And what we have is maybe these constellations of experiences. People feel lonely, you feel something mm -hmm. off, you feel ashamed, but behind mm -hmm. that, there is this misattunement. So how can people mm -hmm. look into that? Well, to me, like a, a real telltale sign is like the emotional aloneness. Mm -hmm. Like if you're, you know, at home or, you know, 10 o'clock at night by yourself or up at three in the morning and you're like feeling hurt or sad or stressed and then you're feeling really alone in it, like mm -hmm. there's no you have no one you could really talk to about what you're feeling or someone that, you know, would really attune to you and care um, and be able to be with you in it. Like, I think that that is a sign and, you know, for myself and many of my clients that struggle with this, um, then you immediately go to the self doubt that you're all what, why am I having problems? My life is privileged. Like I shouldn't be, it's my fault that I'm feeling lonely or it's my fault that I'm feeling down or hurt or like I need to be better about it. So I think it's, if you're feeling like bad or disconnected and, um, and you're feeling like alone in it that you, you, you can't, and then you're like kind of ashamed of it because you feel like you shouldn't be feeling this way. So to me, that is the deepest level. Mm -hmm. One question that pops up in my mind is that does the self-doubt and the shame look different, feel different, sound different if it's related to chronic misattunement? What would you say? Um. Well, I think the self-doubt and the shame are that you shouldn't be feeling this way. You haven't had real abuse. You, you know, you have a job or a marriage or like, and so, yeah, I, you know, it's probably similar to shame and self-doubt for people struggling with other things too, like maybe with addiction or something, but but I kind of think this process underlies like addiction, depression, some anxiety. Like it's like what is causing mm -hmm. um, like this lack of being able to be with your own or, or, or feel like 
felt or co-regulated with or in tune with others. Um, like I think if that is happening chronically, like that can lead to the other disorders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's quite answering your question. No, I think you answered the question. I like the frame that you're having that this is perhaps misattunement is more like a process behind many struggles. And that leads me to my next question. You mentioned when you were sharing your story that one of the ways that you manage this experience of misattunement was by self-sufficiency. Yeah. What about other forms of plenty safe moves that you have seen and witnessed that people do when they are experiencing misattunement? What do they do? Yeah, well, I've focused a little bit and been interested in this, like, shoring yourself up like it's maybe a little bit more avoidant attachment where you mm -hmm. just take it all on yourself and you know overwork and um don't ask that your needs be met um don't even know what your needs are mm -hmm. <laughs> um so those are some of the plain it's safe moves if you're more avoidant attachment i guess if you're more anxious attachment your plain it's safe moves would be you yeah, to be seeking reassurance and like trying to get people in there with you but in a way that's like too pushy or, or too needy or too much mm -hmm. um i think another big category is um less vulnerability like interpersonal vulnerability and um and sharing with others like your emotional needs um mm -hmm. What would other plain it safe moves be? Um, yeah, probably like substance abuse. You just try and numb it all, you know? Yeah, blame others and mm -hmm. externalize your pain. Those are a few. It give us a flavor how Mr. Truman can show up in different behaviors. If I can ask a little bit more, as you were sharing these plain it safe moves, I was wondering about the quality of the relationships when mm. a person is experiencing misattunement. How would you describe their connections? What are indicators that they have to pay attention to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've looked a little bit more recently, again, as this chronic misattunement and then people that cope a little bit more with this self-sufficiency or avoidant attachment. And so in that case, I think that people are first with their relationship with themselves, like they're a little disconnected from themselves because they're just trying to people please to get approval or achieve or do, you know, what pleases others. Um, and so there's a self-abandonment there that happens so number one relationship with yourself is disrupted and then yeah relationship with others is disrupted um and across many relationships not all some you know people do have psychologically safe people a, a bit but in many relationships they won't feel psychologically safe and so they're not being fully real or vulnerable or asking for what they need or they're kind of disconnected from themselves and just busy and pushing through in relationship with someone else. So there isn't like a real, yeah, like meeting of each other with emotional openness and love and reciprocity. And yeah, yeah. I find it so powerful to hear that as you were talking, my mind is going to revisit all my past relationships. <laughs> like, how so? What are you thinking? I think many times in my life, I crave for intimate, rich, and meaningful yeah. relationships. Like, and I feel grateful when I experience that. Yeah. I'm very grateful for those connections with people. And at the same time, I think that sometimes we have relationships or we have encounters in which there is a mismatch. And either maybe I was too guarded or people were too guarded. And it's hard. And as you were talking, I was really thinking about how helpful it's for all of us, for people listening to us, to really check the quality of our connections. Mm -hmm. What kind of we are connecting with others. 
are we going into what you are describing, people pleasing behaviors, and we abandon ourselves, and we pushing too much for connection. So yeah, I was revisiting and doing an inventory of all my relationships (laughs) in a fraction of moments. (laughs) I know. And I hear you, Patricia, like in different moments too. I feel like people can have guards up to various degrees that cause a disconnect. And then if they were like on vacation, a couple drinks and relaxed, (laughs) they might be able to totally connect. And so that's one thing, since this is my problem too, like being chronically misattuned to and kind of have a little bit of avoidant coping style, you know, I have coped with having my guard up. And so something I need to do Mm -hmm. is remember that even if we're not quite connecting right now, this means that either I'm not able to fully let my guard down or they're not. It doesn't mean that this is the quality of our connection. Like it could be more or deeper than this. Like I try and really open to that um yeah love it i love it i think that is really important because our relationships are like organic entities they are evolving and morphing and and i think sometimes we may get discouraged or disappointed with ourselves or frustrated with others because of these moments of mismatch but if we put relationships in context they are not necessarily static Hopefully we also experience moments of connection and goofiness and intimacy. Um, And that leads me to my other question. Um, As we are talking about chronic misattunement, how it can be unrecognized by many of us through our eyes and through our mind, I can hear some of my clients and our listeners wondering, how can I make a shift? If I'm yeah. feeling this mismatch in my relationships, um, if I have more an avoidant style or I have more an anxious style, what can I do about it? Would you mind sharing some tips or principles that people can, can put into action in their day-to-day life as they go back to their relationships? Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, I think step one is to really take care of yourself. Like if you are feeling like a little triggered because someone didn't attune to you or you feel like they missed you um, and it is, you are a little extra triggered by it because of your history. I think step one is you just want to like love yourself. Like, you know, oh, like Kelly or Patricia, like, yeah, you were hurt this way when you were younger. So of course you're getting a little extra triggered that this person, you know, looked the other way while you were trying to talk to them. And um, and to just take some deep breaths and like give yourself a little bit of love. And so like a lot of self-regulation tools mm-hmm. of acceptance, commitment therapies, self-compassion, mindfulness, based therapy. So I think to take care of yourself at first and then, um, when your nervous system like is a little bit more like calm down, um, like to identify kind of what you need or what you want relationally. And Mm -hmm. it's not always psychologically safe, but if it feels um, good enough in this relationship with this person to, um, take a little bit of a risk, you know, like something that gets your anxiety to like a five out of 10, that would be risky for you to say to this person and, Mm -hmm. and, you know, and not like eight out of 10, like if it's that high, then that it's probably not psychologically safe enough, but like take a little bit of a risk and be all, Oh, Hey, like I really value our relationship and I'd like to feel us to feel closer. And what just happened right there made me feel more distant from you. Mm-hmm. you know um and so to say um your need um mm-hmm. to that a little bit so mm-hmm. those are kind of two steps i was nodding my head as you were talking because um i do appreciate to acknowledge and make room for our own health when it's happening um no later on after that conversation but there are moments in which we are hurting because we're not experiencing something that we hope to experience and I love how you talk about self-love. Yeah. Because I think it starts there, acknowledging and making room for our hurts. It reminds me how many times 
in order to experience connection and the richness of being seen by another person, that means that we have to take interpersonal risks. Yeah. I don't think we can experience love without taking a risk with another person. Mm -hmm. And I love also what you say, that you have to check the degree of risk, right? Do you feel safe enough to make the step? So I find it very helpful to hear you talking about those tips. In your email, you mentioned this beautiful acronym. I think Uh the acronym is ATTUN. Mm -hmm. Will it be okay to maybe describe each one of these skills for our audience, for our listeners? Sure. And so, yeah, so I'm, you know, fascinated with this topic. I love um, helping clients with this and I I grow. And so at the moment I've come up with an acronym name, Attune, and it's going to change and evolve over the years. But this is where I'm at today with a good six steps to work with yourself. Um, And so step one is to acknowledge that you're emotionally misattuned to, like, I have so many clients that are all no, I can't think badly about my parent. Like they tried so hard, they gave everything. And then they aren't acknowledging that they're actually really emotionally hurting underneath and then doing a lot of safe behaviors or compensatory behaviors. And so step one is to be all, no, like my parent just had lower emotional intelligence or they really didn't learn from their parents, like how to do this whole empathy thing. And and so you don't need to blame who's doing this you can just accept that their emotional intelligence skill might be lower but you acknowledge that you were um some of your emotional needs were really not met so that's so a is acknowledge uh step two is t to tune into your higher self and so this is kind of self as context and acceptance and commitment therapy or awareness in Buddhism or self leadership and internal family systems therapy. It's like to shift from the, your, your thinking mind to more your observing self. And it's from that space that you can kind of catch your triggered reactions and bring yourself self-compassion. And so just kind of shifting from that small self to a bigger self. So Step two is T to tune into your higher self. And then step three is T to tend to your emotional needs. And and this is kind of what I said earlier, like to soothe yourself, use emotion regulation to calm your system down. If you're really distressed or dysregulated, use self-compassion. Step three, um, step four is you, which is to undo emotional aloneness and This is to really be in your emotional hurt or your emotional vulnerability, like saying, hey, like so-and-so really missed me or wasn't there for me, um, or like my partner cheated on me or, you know, whatever the situation is to be in your raw emotion and to have someone else see it and like sit with you in it. Like often this happens in therapy. Um, so you co-regulate with the other person and you're not alone in your pain. You're, and this is what wasn't done for people with chronic misattunement, like by their parents or in other relationships. And so the step four is to undo emotional aloneness. And it's kind of a core feature of AEDP, Accelerated Experiential Dynamic Therapy, Mm -hmm. or it's a little bit in FAP, um, FAP therapy and a little bit in, uh, EFT emotion focused therapy, um, is, is kind of the step. And then the next step, step five is to narrate your life from an updated perspective. And so to, yeah, to shift, because often people are in a story of like, my childhood was not that bad. Like, why am I depressed? Like mm-hmm. get, get it together. And so to kind of shift from a self blame story to, Oh wait, like I was emotionally misattuned to, and that's why I've like kind of struggled emotionally. Um, and so to not blame others or yourself and, and so narrate your life from a more self-respecting perspective. Mm-hmm. And then the last step is E, um, 
to empower yourself to take up emotional and relational space. And, and so to kind of know what your emotional needs are, like express them in the world more. Um, and, and even like ask or like, instead of being so self-sufficient and taking care of everything yourself, like to actually be more um, foster constructive dependency where you say, hey, like I could really use some help here or it'd be nicer like if you were sitting next to me like as I did this um, or to really authentically say what you think. And so this is a little bit the second tip that I said earlier. So it's to um, do the actions and the behaviors that you're, you're not doing um, when you're just showing up and trying to do it all yourself. And so it's to um, speak and act in the world in a way that you're um, facilitating attunement with yourself and others. Wow, Kelly, as you were sharing these skills, my heart was beating a little bit fast and not because of panic, but because of excitement. <laughs> because it was because of joy because I cannot imagine how it is to reconnect with ourselves and with others, practice these skills and experience yourself in the context of this new frame, of this new mindset with others and with yourself. So they all sound really empowering and a path to experience connection and intimacy. That's why my heart was beating fast. <laughs> I love it, Patricia. Yeah. I love connection and intimacy too and I do think these are steps that um, can help us lean into it more and get out of our own way a little bit and and facilitate it more in relationships and and the world really needs it you know like so that's exciting too to think of more ways to you know help future generations with the loneliness problem and the disconnection problem it's um, I think these steps can help with that. That's true. And Kelly, I know you mentioned that this acronym may evolve or shift. Yeah. Would you feel comfortable if I publish them on the website with your name, of course, citing you? So for people listening to us, they can take a look onto them. Sure. I will do that and I will just link it to your website as well. Uh, it is helpful to have a roadmap of yeah. the work that we need to do. And I think these steps plus the conversation are providing that to our listeners. So many, many thanks. One thought that was in the background of my mind, and hopefully it's a helpful thought, we will see, is that when we think about human struggles and the things that we're stuck with, there are some names and forms of it that are very well known, like mm -hmm. social anxiety, productivity anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, depression, and it gives us a road map so we know what to do about them. But there yeah. are other times other forms of pain that are invisible and they are yeah. hidden. And we go years with that feeling, knowing that something is off, but we don't yeah. have the name to it. So I am very grateful that today we're talking about the invisible pain of chronic misattunement that a lot of people may be dealing with without knowing. I love, yeah, you phrasing that. Yeah, it, I, it is interesting how it's not defined or named anywhere. And it's kind of like the product of, of emotional abuse or emotional neglect, or I'm using the word now trauma of omission. Like you don't <laughs> know you're missing it because it wasn't there. Like you never got it. And so you yeah, I have some clients like that, like, and it's just, yeah, so that's what you were alluding to earlier. It's an invisible trauma or little t trauma. Um, there's a woman out there, too, that's written a few books now on adult children of emotionally immature parents, <laughs> which mm -hmm. is, she's trying to capture it there a bit. And it's, um, I agree, like, and so I think it's neat to start to name this. And what's interesting too, is some of my clients, like they look like they have complex trauma, even mm -hmm. though they didn't, you know, they weren't tortured or that, you know, they didn't have, um, they weren't feeling physically unsafe, 
but it happened like thousands and thousands and thousands of times through childhood that it like it's so many it's like death by paper cuts um and so it, it's it's a big deal <laughs> it is it is a big deal i am very grateful we're chatting about it and kelly i have one last question if you were to have a cup of tea or coffee or a beer or a scotch with any person you want today who will that be and why let's see you know it would probably just be my mom um mm-hmm. she had a stroke and or an aneurysm yeah like a stroke and then was just gone one day you know she was only 72 so didn't really get to um yeah talk about this lifetime we had together and so it'd be neat to be able to do that i'm sure it would be a very sweet conversation we run out of time so really thank you for this opportunity to talk about it a bit it's it's awesome (laughs) it's a pleasure it's a pleasure thanks for listening if you like this episode i will very much appreciate it if you will subscribe and share this podcast with your friends and if you're feeling extra generous i welcome a review on apple Podcasts. show notes of this episode are in the website playing it safe that's on make sure to subscribe to my newsletter so you can receive more tips to stop all types of unworkable playing it safe actions. See you soon.